fact that society works proves that security works. What that means on the internet remains to be seen. I am near-term pessimistic, but I am long-term optimistic. I think we as society will figure this out. That privacy and liberty are so important to us as a people that we will reestablish it. When the Guardian newspaper needed help analyzing the technical details of the giant trove of NSA files leaked by Edward Snowden, they went to one man. Bruce Schneier is a renowned expert in cryptography and security issues. Today he's a fellow at the Berkman Center at Harvard, where he's researching the intersection of power and the internet. What's cryptography? I mean, cryptography is basically mathematical security. Right? It's encryption. It's, it's protecting my data as I send it to you, or my data on my hard drive. It's basically keeping all of these security properties intact as we move from the real world to the digital world. Security is how society functions. And this is true whether you're living in small family groups in the East African Highlands or 100,000 BC, or 2013 New York City. And you're dealing with a large group of people, all of whom will cooperate with each other, will compete with each other, will deceive each other, will be truthful. And security is how that group stays together. Today we had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center. Now, after 9-11, we got scared. And when people are scared, they'll do anything to make themselves feel better. And politicians were scared. They were scared something else would happen and they would get blamed. We were scared that something else would happen and the terrorists would kill our children. And those two fears meant the politicians said, we must do anything to stop it. And the people said, we'll let you do anything to stop it, even if those things aren't effective. Right? Even if those things don't actually do any good, we want them done. And I believe the president called the NSA and said, all right, you're it, go. Right? Forget about the law, forget about balance, forget about budget, forget about everything. Eavesdrop as much as you can to stop the next one. Right? And here we are, what, you know, a dozen years later, and you know, now we know that 9-11 was an anomaly. I mean, back then we thought it would happen once a year. So we do need to dial the balance back. It is much more important for this country that we defend this nation and take the beatings than it is to give up a program that would result in this nation being attacked. We would rather be here in front of you today telling you why we defended these, these programs than having given them up and have our nation or our allies be, in attack, be attacked and people killed. I don't think anyone's saying that the NSA shouldn't do spying. You know, we, we understand, I think, as a society, that we need to let the government invade our privacy. That we do that for important reasons. I mean, take the police. I mean, we give the police enormous leeway and power to invade our privacy because that helps them solve crimes. And we do that willingly but there's transparency and oversight to protect us. And we don't have that with national intelligence. I mean, it actually amazes me that General Keith Alexander still has a job. And this is the greatest intelligence failure in the history of ever, and he is still in charge of the NSA. Right, that the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Clapper, can outright lie to Congress, and he still has a job. I mean, that speaks to an enormous amount of power here, and that's worrisome. If you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently, perhaps, uh, collect but not, not wittingly. Did you always assume that the government had this sort of power? More poignantly, what changed after the Snowden revelations for you? Nothing in the Snowden documents technically is really a surprise. And this analogy I've been using, and it's, 
It's a tough one, but I think it's actually accurate, and that's thinking about death. It's not a surprise. Everybody dies. It's the way the story ends. Yet when it happens, it's always a surprise. And that's because we just don't think about it. You know, we decide not to think about it. And it's, a, it's almost a conscious decision. I think this NSA surveillance was sort of like that. And now what Snowden's doing is he's forcing us to think about it very explicitly. What among the revelations to you is most uh, of a concern? You know, to me, the, the, the worst thing that the NSA has been doing is deliberately weakening cryptography. Because there, they're actually hurting people. And there, they're abdicating one of their missions. The NSA has two missions. I mean, basically, it's listen in to their communications and protect our communications. And those missions made sense together during the Cold War, where you'd eavesdrop on the Soviet stuff and you'd protect the, uh, the NATO stuff. And since 9-11 at least, they've chosen pretty much exclusively to weaken the internet to listen to the bad guys. And that really feels like the wrong decision. Uh, let me ask you about anonymity. Is that, is that the, the thing that we, that we are trying to sort of protect most or to, to cherish most on the internet? This, this right to privacy, essentially? You know, what we're trying to protect most on the internet is, is, our, is control. You walk into a party and there are strangers and there are friends and you are immediately able to control your data. What you tell people, what you don't, what you go into a private room to have a conversation, what you say in the open where, where strangers can overhear. We know how to do this. We have evolved to be able to do that. We're just not good on the internet. So when you get an email from someone that says, you know, hi, I heard you're pregnant. Here's some advertising. You look at it and say, how did they know that? It's not about secrecy, because you probably told your doctor, you probably told your spouse, you might have told your parents, but you didn't tell this advertising company. So it's not about anonymity. It's not about secrecy. It's about control. What are some of your concerns about just how deeply the surveillance state goes? I'm most worried about how robust it all is. Yeah, and we all know this person, right? They are an Apple person. They have an Apple computer, an Apple phone, they use iCloud. Effectively, they give all of their data to Apple in exchange for security. And it's great security, right? You lose an you know, iPhone, you get a new one, you push a button, your data magically appears on it. Other people trust Google in that same way. I mean, the NSA didn't just wake up and said, we're gonna eavesdrop on the planet. They woke up and said, hey, wait a second. The phone companies, the internet, these people are already producing a system that lets us eavesdrop. Let's just piggyback off it. Now, the NSA couldn't do their job if it wasn't for all these companies producing the data for them. Now we're living in a world where corporate power can buy government power in some instances, and yet there are nothing nearly the legal controls. And it's very much a feudal relationship. The feudal lords will protect these users to the extent they do in exchange for allegiance. Now, this is very one-way relationship, right? These feudal lords can abuse you, they can buy you, they can sell you, you're tied to your land. It's actually very hard to leave some of these systems. We need something akin to a Magna Carta for corporations that says, yes, you have all of these rights, but you also have all these responsibilities. And everybody's got one of these things and we're sharing data all the time. We're giving data up fairly freely. Do we bear a certain amount of responsibility for this particular power grab that you're describing? I mean, the public, yes. We, we give our data willingly to, to Apple on our iPhone, to, uh, to Facebook. But we don't really do it consciously. You know, we're doing it incidentally. We're on Facebook because we want to talk to our friends. We don't go on Facebook and say, let's tell advertisers all about us today. Right? We don't pick up our phone and say, I'm going to let Apple surveil me all day. We want to get phone calls. So it's happening in the background. And for most people, it's not salient. So I don't like blaming the people. That feels really unfair. We really have to blame the systems that we've built that enable all of this surveillance. And, and the public's role is is advocate. I mean, the, the, the solutions here are going to be political. They're going to be laws that protect our data, protect our privacy, that limit what governments and corporations can do with our data. 
And, and that kind of political change, I think it's gonna be slow in coming, but eventually that's where we're gonna get our security. Right now, we still have the US senators that brag about never using email. I mean, those people cannot figure out a sensible privacy policy for the internet. It has to be digital natives, people who've been born into the internet, who understand what it means in someone's life to establish those boundaries. I have uh, a Linux box, I, you know, I, I do quite a lot of different things. And you also have a... We're gonna wait for the helicopter. The black helicopters are coming. It is a black helicopter. <laughs>